Okay, and then the last area, influencing. So stroking the sheep is um, Keith Singer. It's one of the main motivations behind Giving What We Can. He's a utilitarian philosopher. And he has his, he's a member of Giving What We Can, and he has a similar organisation. Um, so that's, he's an example of someone who's probably persuaded thousands of people to lead them, change their, change their lives and done a huge amount of good. And that's, that's the power of uh, influencing people to do other high-impact activities. So we're going to go back to our story. Um, we've got the, uh, the altruistic banker, but then the canny persuader, the third and possibly even smarter <laughs> obstetrician, and she decides not to go into banking, but instead to persuade 10 students to become altruistic bankers. So she persuades 10, they each pay for 10 doctors, each doctor <laughs> saves um, 10, 10 kiddies per week, um, so I think that's a thousand lives then, which she saves each week. Each week. And w no, we reckon, so we said, I'll just bank it, easily make 12,000 lives, so just call it 10,000. Can he influence a, in, can convince 100 people to become altruistic bankers? So that's two or three per year. And that means the canny influence has saved a million lives. So that's really getting impressive now. And Will's helpfully copied and pasted the clone children. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get an idea of the scale, obviously. So... You know, is that not the definitive argument? Is it not better just to go out, persuade people to give away money? Well, it's not quite the end of the argument. So you could influence people to make money, but you could also become a banker and then pay for people to work for giving what we can and go out and eat with people. <laughs> and you can, keep, you can do that again, probably. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't have any altruistic bankers yet, so there's no one, there's no one to pay me. But it's really just a big, big term scheme. <laughs> so this is this is um, an, is an issue for the debate, and I've been thinking a lot about the the solution to this over the last week. Um, and I haven't put it in the talk because it's a little bit involved, but I could. I'm happy to talk about it if someone wants to get in touch. Um, but actually, I think you only need to worry about the first step. Um, this is, in, interestingly, there's almost no academic literature on the ethics of career choice, so it, we're literally like at the, we're literally founding a, founding <laughs> a <laughs> area of practical ethics. Um, Top 0.01% of your field. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Will. I'm the bottom 100% of your field. I'm the money maker, so that's actually Will, who's the one going into research. Well, um, there is only one, <laughs> one article on the ethics of career choice, and the author of that has now died. So I think we are 100% of the field. We, one of you is the top. Which we is. Oh, yeah. Right. Get out of bed. Um, so we've tried to resolve this um, regress issue. And uh, I think my arguments are that the minute the most important consideration is the first step. So you've got X hours to spend on something. Should you spend it earning money? Or should you spend it persuading people to donate money? And I reckon it's just whichever one of those causes the biggest donation. And probably at the current stage, because no one knows about giving what we can, really, in, in the general population. So uh, if you persuade one person to join giving what we can, you probably cause the donation of at least 50,000 to charity over their lifetime. And that's including giving them a quite a good chance of just giving up. We, we pick an account of that. And that's also based on the earnings of our current members, who are mostly pretty, pretty low. So it's, we discounted it heavily because of the chance of people quitting. So, so I'm sorry, you just, it's 50,000 annual donation? Do you mean sorry, different? if you're persuading one person per year, sorry, yeah. then one person per year, each person who joins giving what we can is roughly a 50,000 donation, and probably a bit more because most of us are pretty low paid at the minute. So. Um, or we're, we're a lot of giving what we can members are planning to become academics. Um, so if you can persuade you know, doctors or bankers, then it's more than 50,000. 
And th that's probably more than you can donate from many careers. Um, if you become the kind of uh, mid-range investment banker, that's about 300,000 per year. So if you can persuade more than six people per year to join Giving What We Can, you should probably do that rather than go into banking. Um, at least given the current state of affairs, because no one really considers cost effectiveness when donating, no one really considers giving away half of their income. So there's, there's a lot of low hanging fruit around, um, and you can probably persuade six people per year. So we, re we actually reckon this could be one of the highest impact career choices. But there are some important caveats. So firstly, the most effective way to persuade people to donate money is probably to do so yourself, have a real career and give the money away, rather than being kind of a professional promoter. Um, and I mean, like Toby is a good example of that. Like he got, he's, he's been given a huge, like, huge coverage on the BBC and that's because you know, the headline is Oxford Academic gives away most of its money. Um, but if Toby was just like employed by giving what we can, um, and kind of telling everyone to give away the money, uh, it's probably not going to be very persuasive at all. And then there's some extra consideration for become a money maker because so few of you will go into money making with the purpose of donating to charity that you could just have a really big influence. Like it, it, there's you you be among a very small group of people, and you know that could serve as an, a kind of example. And then the other, pretty, this, this could actually be a very significant factor. If you're high earning, um, it's much easier to meet and influence other high earning people. So firstly, that all your colleagues will be high earning. And secondly, if you're high earning, they're probably, if you're high earning giving away most of your money, it's probably much easier to persuade someone else who's high earning, um, rather than someone who's perhaps very lowly paid and the person thinks, well, obviously we have different priorities. But if these are two very similar people, but one's giving away all their money, that's much more persuasive. And you've got to bear in mind that if you can persuade one investment banker to join giving what we can, that makes up for about five to ten um, academics join giving what we can in terms of the donations. Uh, so there's, there's quite a big... That could be a very significant factor, but as I say, these, these issues are kind of up for debate. And then within influencing, there's just, firstly there's just persuading people to give away money, but then there's also having direct influence on policy. So cost effectiveness, it's, it, people don't really take it as seriously as it, as it deserves. And there's an incredible fact which Toby and Will discovered when they were researching giving what we can. Some health charities are 10,000 times more effective than other health charities. So you spend one dollar in one charity and you save a year of life, but in another charity you save one ten thousandth of a year of life. And like, if you can just imagine this happening in any other market, like one restaurant you get one pizza, one restaurant you get ten thousand pizzas, <laughs> <laughs> that would never be allowed to happen. But that's what it's like for charities. So there is just an incredible. There is just so much low hanging fruit that if you could influence NGO and government policy, just to switch from a couple of the 1,000-fold um, charities, you know, you could increase cost effectiveness 100, 1,000-fold quite easily in many situations. And that's obviously a huge benefit. And then obviously another type of direct influence is going into politics. And this is a pretty serious, this is a pretty serious option. Um, provided you can meet <laughs> politician standards of charisma, I'm not sure it's really charisma, but it's a certain kind of certain kind of skill you need to have. Good lying. Uh, <laughs> well, lying in a, yeah, well, a distinctive way, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, well, like... You you have I, to the no, I, I don't think I could go into politics, I don't have that. But, uh, you have a, you have pretty good odds. Um, like, most of our cabinet is from Oxford, um, so if you really wanted to work on your connections, volunteer for the Labour Party, you've got pretty good odds. And of course, you know, if you're really serious about this, you could, you know, you could totally toe, toe the party line, but just hold out for a couple of key policies which can make a huge, huge difference. Um, 
increasing cost effectiveness, as we, as we mentioned, um, policy reform, which helps the developing world. And just as an example, the UK aid budget is about 9 billion. So a three that's 0.7% that's of GDP. So a 3.3% increase, which is basically completely negligible, um, that could save 1 million lives if it goes into the most cost-effective charities. And if you only have a 1% chance of achieving that, then you, you expect to save 10,000 lives. So that's kind of, it's kind of altruistic banker levels just in that one act. That's a very pretty low-scale act for what's, what's possible with politics. And of course, you're also a public figure, so you have quite a lot of scope to just persuade people to give away more money. Um, you know, probably particularly when you leave office. I'm not sure. You'd probably be regarded as a whacker if you came out with that. Early, but, um, you're a public figure, so you've got some opportunities there. Okay, so that's the three areas. And now we're going to look at the kind of grains of truth in the standard. Um, and that's that, of course, what you're passionate about and what your talents, where your talents lie does matter because you need to decide between those kind of careers. You need to think, think about which ones you could realistically pursue, and moreover, which ones you'll excel in. And remember that if you excel in a career, the marginal benefit problem is much reduced because the person who would replace you is much worse at it than you, so you're doing much, you're doing much more benefit if you go into things that you excel at. And then you also, this is a pretty serious consideration, um, you need to discount the, cut the, the courses depending on how likely you are actually to go through with it. So if you're passionate about something, it's much less likely, it's likely you'll burn out. But if you absolutely can't stand the idea of becoming an investment banker and you know, before the deadline they expect you to work a 100 hour week and you just give up after a year or two, then that's clearly not the best thing to do. Um, okay, so just how can you go about planning your high impact career? Um, so one question is to ask, you know, if I, if I really went for money making, how much money could I make? And we think the answer is quite a lot, uh, but it will depend on your circumstances. So that's one thing to bear in mind and you can compare that to the other, course, the other courses of action. The next thing is, could, do you have the chance to make really big impact with your research? Maybe, maybe you can do more impact like that, make more impact like that. And then, are you in some kind of special position where you could quite easily influence policy? You know, could you go into politics, basically? And then, putting all those, thinking through all those, how can you put yourself in the best position to persuade other people? Um, it might be the answer is just, like, eventually working to give them what we can and you know, helping to promote, expand to other universities. Or it might be that actually the best way is to become a money maker and try to persuade other money makers to give away money. Or it might be, uh, might be that actually as a researcher, but you know, if you're researching um, very cost-effective policies, then that's actually the best way to persuade people to donate to those policies. So then the last thing is maybe it's probably going to be some combination for most people. And that's the end of my talk, so uh, I'll just hand it back to Will to um, make some conclusions. So, great, thank you, Ben.